have a, a great talk up next from Lin Sun about the truth about adopting a service mesh. And again, I uh, appreciate everybody's patience for the slight uh, schedule change up and everything. Uh, but I believe we are ready to go with Lynn now. Uh, can you hear me okay, Lynn? Yeah, I can hear you okay. So just to make sure I have 25 minutes. Uh, yeah, and, and actually, if, if you want to take a little bit more time, that's totally fine. Uh, all uh, Anybody watching, feel free to drop some questions, uh, and I'll, I'll definitely ask those at the end. So uh, so we'll, we have plenty of time. I, I believe that the next hard break is going to be a stop at, uh, looks like, maybe uh, 2.50 uh, Pacific time. So we uh, uh, we can take all the time we want from, from now until then. Okay, that sounds great. So I will take questions at the end because I'm sharing screen. I won't be able to see the questions. So welcome <laughs> to my, so I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the session, uh, the truth about adopting a service mesh. Let me quickly introduce myself. Um, I've been working in the cloud native uh, container service mesh space for a very long time since Docker and Kubernetes and now Istio. I've been contributing to Istio for the past four years. Um, I've actually wrote a book about Istio, Istio Explained. So I've been a maintainer on the project. I've also served on the technical oversight committee of the project. Um, the other fun side of me is I do have a lot of patents uh, issued by uh, the patent officer. So uh, I was an IBMer for 19 years. Um, and before I leave, I take a snapshot of how many patents I have uh, been issued. And uh, I joined this uh, small startup called Solo.io um, about three, four months ago. So um, the thought process for adopting a service mesh. Uh, first of all, you want to really understand what is a service mesh. And then the next thing I want you to think about is, do you really need a service mesh? And what are the service mesh projects available out there? And once you determine which project you are going to land on, then the next question you know you're going to likely ask is well you are going to get started with this right um, what are the surprises you might be finding out and what are the benefits of the service mesh um, and what are the next steps so challenges with microservices um, Marco actually talk about connectivity right so that's like the number one challenging around connectivity is how do you observe the interaction of your microservices, how do you secure communication with zero trust um, being really popular these days where you don't trust any of your services? How do you secure the communication of your services? And how do you build resilience into your services so that you could do automatic retries and uh, timeout or you can inject port into your microservices? And how do you control traffic when you have multiple versions? How do you control the traffic precisely to the way you want it to be? Um, the service mesh is really designed to solve this problem for you um, by providing a program framework that's language agnostic to allow you to connect secure and uh, observe your microservices. So some of these problems that we're solving through service mesh is really to enable you to discover your services automatically to be able to secure your services um, the communication among your services to be able to allow you to configure which service can connect to which services maybe on a particular path and on a particular method to allow you to control your traffic and apply policies uh, to many of your services and to allow you to observe what's going on within your microservices and to provide a programming interface for you so you don't have to configure the lower level service proxy yourself, which are not really meant for humans. 
So how does the service mesh work? Uh, really quickly, for those of you not familiar with service mesh, so typically a service mesh has a control plane and a data plane. So on the top is the, the control plane. Um, and on the bottom, because they are part of your application data uh, request pass, so we call it the data plane. So the way the service mesh works is that the service proxy intercepts your traffic um, as the source service connects to the target service. The service proxy helps to mediate the traffic. And by having the service proxy mediate the traffic on the source and the target site, we were able to send the telemetry data. We were able to control how the traffic to shift uh, to be shifted. We were able to upgrade the connection from plain text to uh, mutual TLS. And then the control plane provides a human understandable API. So you can program in the control plane, which under the cover program in the sidecar proxy based on your business needs. Now, once you have a little bit of understanding of uh, what service mesh, now it really gets into, do you really need a service mesh? Because service mesh is actually complicated. Um, many of you played with microservices. You probably know microservices are complicated. Um, so the first question I think you want to ask is, are you building a microservice architecture? Do you have multiple languages? Do you have multiple frameworks? This is important because if you only have one language, chances are you're going to think, you know, you could have a language pack and that language pack solve all these problems for you. And that's exactly what Netflix OSS did for uh, the Java language they have. And also, you want to look at how many services do you have, because the fact you have to operate that service mesh control plan to be able to keep up with the trends and changes in service mesh, you have to have more than a few services to really benefit from the thing. Um, so we really want you to think through all that. So really, only you can answer, do you really need a service mesh? You want to look at, are you going cloud native? Do you have containers and Kubernetes, right? Are you using state on this? Are you using ephemerals? Um, are you having dynamic scaling? And looking at what frameworks you have, are you using TCP or HTTP or are you using messaging framework? Maybe service mesh was not as important in the messaging world, right? Do you need to apply common policies? Uh, do you need to secure um, the service interaction? Because your security team constantly asks you, hey, um, you, we can't really allow you just secure the edge, but not secure any of your intro services um, behind the edge. Um, you want to look at, you know, do you need to observe what's going on with your services? Do you need to have better visibilities of your services so you can pin down which team should looking at this problem? Maybe you are not ready for service mesh yet, but we want you to keep an eye out for explosion in the number of services, because those are the signs um, you might be ready for a service mesh uh, to check out how many languages you have. Do you have language specific pack? You have to keep maintaining and updating them, and maybe adding languages, um, more and more languages, so that it gets harder to maintain. Um, do you have certification management issue that you have to figure out how do you rotate your key and cert maybe every other day or every other month to meet your security standards? Do you need better observability between your services? The other thing I want you to think through is do you have supporting infrastructures to embrace service mesh? Are you using a source control system like Git? Are you using CI CD pipeline uh, like Argo CD today? Do you have artifact repository, right? Do you have logging and metrics and tracing in place today? Because those are key components to help you um, adopt a service mesh. At the end of the day, service mesh, um, the sidecar proxy, 
it's going to be part of your critical piece of your infrastructure because it's part of every single request flow. So it's super important to decide, you know, whether it's right for you and also pick a service mesh that's popular and widely adopted. So that gets down to, you know, how do you select a service mesh? Assuming you go through the line, you're really interested in a service mesh. So I think a first thing I want you to think through is, are you going to use Envoy proxy, which is the dominant service proxy at the moment? Or are you going to use something else? So if you look at, the ecosystem in service mesh that's using Envoy proxy today. There are Istio, there are open service mesh, there's Console Connect, there's a QMA, which is um, you heard Marco talk about, right? QMA is con service mesh. There's also uh, AWS service mesh, uh, app mesh from AWS Cloud. So many of these projects landed on Envoy because Envoy is the most widely adopted um, proxy at the moment. Then there's also LinkedIn e and traffic service mesh, which they are using some other proxy. You also want Kaylin, to look at uh, Yeah. I'm so, so sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if you could maybe uh, check your slides. I think uh, uh, we're, we're getting the, the different screen being shared out. So if you could uh, go ahead and Maybe stop sharing your slides and share them again real quick. We're, we're not getting them through on the side. Okay, which slides are you seeing? Cool, yeah, I, I think you were full screen and we were just seeing like the, the output of, of one. So uh, that that's actually looking okay. If you could maybe try presenting okay. and we'll see if, it, if that. Uh, Sorry about that. Do you see maturity 15 slides? Uh, no, 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 I, I think it's probably the presenting thing. It looks like it's, it's uh, it's okay. uh, going yeah. to a different monitor or something. Um, Thank you, you for reminding me that. Let me actually try this in Chrome, see if it works better. Yeah, and you could probably even keep it on that on that screen and step through the slides that way. Um, that'd be okay too, I think. Okay, um, I will try this. If it doesn't work, um, I guess I have to reshare. So do you... Um, Maybe I'll just present cool. this way because I had to reshare if yeah. I if I use a different. Product. Yeah, yeah, that's totally okay. cool. Yeah, well, we can see it right now, so I will get out of your way. And again, so sorry for the interruption. I'm glad you did. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> so let me continue. Um, so we talk about okay. We talk about Envoy proxy, right? Um, the next thing we want to look at is production deployment, right? How many users are using these products, right? So Istio is certainly um, the most mature out there. Um, the next one is LinkedIn and console. Um, I actually have a slide uh, shortly to share with a pie chart on that based on the survey last year. Um, the third thing I want you to look at is multi-vendor, right? The vendors who are behind to support each project because those are important because what if the vendor you know change strategy right so from istio we have um i think 300 companies contributing to istio there are big names out there google ibm and lyft are the founder of the project um, solo my company is also um, stand behind istio um, so you can see istio is a very strong vendor support the next thing I want you to think us through is what are the Kubernetes support, right? Kubernetes has already won the container orchestration platform. It is the dominant um, application platform to for developers to run their applications. So the st strongest Kubernetes support today is Istio and LinkedIn. Some of the other service mesh projects um, they support a little bit more on um, some of the long Kubernetes environments like console and Kuma. Uh, VM support is also interesting, right? Because you could have monolithic running outside of Kubernetes today, and maybe you are intending or in the process of moving them to Kubernetes. So you want to land something that actually support VM to allow you to be successful in this transition 
space as you onboarding VM, as you transition going cloud native with Kubernetes. So as you can see, uh, Kuma console is pretty ahead on VM. It still is right in the middle. And then there's some without any VM support, such as LinkedIn. Uh, this is the survey I was just mentioning. So uh, CNCF, uh, KubeCon North American last year did a survey uh, on top of uh, all the users in the community. Um, so there's actually 36, uh, around 36% 36 of users adopting service mesh in production. And this pie chart shows the users who are adopting Istio or other service mesh in production. And these are what they are saying, you know, how many are using which service mesh in production. And I, I think you can see it matches what I had early on that uh, Istio is pretty ahead on production and maturity. So assuming you do agree with the kind of these type of assessment exercise I'm going through, the next question you probably would ask is, where do I start, right? If I'm landing on uh, Istio as the dominant service mesh, um, we would recommend you to start at the edge. Um, the reason you start with the edge is because it's the simplest way to get started with the service mesh, where you can leverage the edge capability provided by Envoy proxy. Envoy is a very intelligent uh, proxy. It's really battle test in many production environments, including Lyft. Um, they run like two million per second, um, you know, on, on the transaction. So, and the nice thing about adopting at the edge is uh, you don't actually have to change your services at all. You don't have to inject the sidecar to any of your services. So the, the impact to your existing requests is really minimized. So there's no service proxy. Certainly you don't get as many of the benefits from the service mesh, but it's a great step to start at the edge to as a first step to adopt a service mesh. Now, the next thing, assuming your adoption of the edge goes well, the next thing you probably want to think through is, what am I going to do next, right? So I want you to think through what are your business needs, not based on the buzzword, right? Do you have a hard requirements on your business side that you have to satisfy? So focus on that specific business needs and focus on adapting the service mesh is still based on their needs first and then keep iterating that to different your, of your services and before you add any other user cases. This is important because service mesh has many functions and we want you to adapt based on what's most relevant for you so you can incrementally and learn things slowly. What we find out from our customer is normally it's a security team said, you know, you have to have mutual TLS. We're really trying to get to a zero trust framework, not just trusting, you know, um, anything behind the proxy on the edge. We really want not trust any of our services. So that's the common most um, adoption point for many of our users. And then we find out, you know, as they adopt a mutual TLS among their services, they're getting telemetry collection for free. We our user, uh, we typically find out them adopting security and then they find out, oh my gosh, I'm actually gaining all the visibilities among my services. That's amazing. Those are the data I would never, you know, seen before and dream about before. And now it's, I'm actually getting all this for free. And the third thing we find users are looking at is some of their requests, maybe they, because they got the observability data, they find out maybe 99.5% this request works, but this 0.5 is generating errors. Now they start looking at service mesh functionality to increase resilience of their services and to you know move from 99.5, maybe to 100 or 99.9%. So this is the resilience control can really help them to 
test, you know, what if the service goes down? You know, how do I, how am I going to handle that? How do I increase my resilience? How do I do circuit breaking, right? To make sure my service is not being, um, using rain limiting to make sure my service is not um, overloaded. And lastly, as users roll out newer version of services, when they move into cloud, it's all about agility, right? To be able to add the specific features their user wanted, um, they're going to have new version of the services. So um, Canary release uh, for specific version to be able to dock launch, do database routing. These are the things um, Service Mesh and specifically Istio provides without you needing to redeploy any of your microservices. Now, I also want you to think about how your team is going to integrate with Istio Service Mesh who is going to own what resources and functions and how much each team needs to learn. What we are seeing with our customer is they typically have a platform team that's like a centralized team who owns um, what are the service mesh adoption strategy, who selects the service mesh to use for their service owner team and who defines these are the things I want to have under control. And these are the things, you know, I want to dedicate, delegate to each of my service owner so they can do their own things without bugging me. As long as, you know, they are doing this thing that I can in control and in their own space, they can do their own thing. That's an extremely powerful scenario we're seeing with a lot of our user base. Um, well, a centralized platform team can support many, many service owner team. It could be scaled from 100 to thousands of service team. So a key thing you want to focus really is how do I hide the learning from each of the service team as the team grows, right? And what are the patterns I want to provide to these team so that the team can potentially self-service without bugging me as the platform team? And how do you enforce policies where you allow some of the overrides from different teams? So these are the different things uh, we want you to think through as you learning Istio to provide uh, best practice patterns for your teams so that they don't have to learn service mesh a lot. What are the surprises as you adopt um, a service mesh like Istio? So remember we talk about your application container, it's going to reside on the same pod with this uh, sidecar proxy, right? So this sidecar proxy is an envoy proxy in Istio and then immediate the traffic comes in and out of your application container. Because today, Kubernetes doesn't support a uh, container dependency at the moment. So the first two surprises um, you might hit is the proxy may start after your application container starts, right? So this means your application container, it may not be able to reach any of the traffic outside of your cluster. This also means when your application container starts, when it talks to other application, um, other services, that traffic may not be secure as you want it to be. So um, there is a flag you can enable a sequence that we provide in Istio so that you can make sure your application container is hold to start until the proxy is ready. So that's, um, if your application container has some requirements, we recommend you to enable those. Uh, and then the proxy may stop before your application container stops. So this could be an issue at stopping time. So typically our user will put a little bit of sleep um, at the proxy stop time. So your application container can stop first because you do want uh, your application stop first and that traffic is secure uh, before your proxy shut down. Uh, container networking um, may have different behavior because the proxy is in the middle to mediate that traffic. 
So the network behavior, like prior to Istio with our 199, we actually require all the services to listen on local host for state for sets, um, especially. So that um, is fixed. So if you have special container network behavior, or if you're using state for sets, we recommend you to check out the newest uh, Istio 1.10. The other thing we our user find out is uh, we actually do um, provide a little bit of intelligence with default um, retries and timeouts. And our user find surprising because we actually would retry um, two times if the request fails, right? So they some of the time, if you're doing a post request, maybe you don't want retries by default. If you're doing a get retry, it's probably OK. So um, these are the surprises so user actually would hit. Certainly, we provide APIs to allow you to tweak um, because this no one size fits everybody. Um, so you want to really adjust based on your business needs. Um, it still has very rich APIs. And sometimes the APIs may be a little bit hard to navigate. Uh, for instance, uh, as you adopt the edge, um, like what we were discussing first, we want you to look at the gateway API and the virtual services to help you config uh, the routes. So essentially, the gateway help you define, you know, these are the hosts you are exposing with this port number, and these are the um, TLS or mutual TLS or TCP, so you can define the protocol you are declaring for that gateway. And then virtual services allows you to config the destination, the routes to the given destination service. So that's like the beginning. People start looking at uh, Istio. They, they will learn those two services. And then as they start to adopt like mutual TLS, they start to look at pure authentication policy. As they start to do um, authorization policy or request authentication, you know, there's new um, customer resources they need to start learning. And then as they start to working on, you know, resilience of their services, as they start to work on different version of their service, they need to learn like virtual service again to configure that route rule, to configure routes to different version, and also destination rule. What are the client side um, destination configuration to reach to that destination client side load balancer configuration? And lastly, if you interact with services on the VM or the services uh, as external to your Kubernetes, there's also service entry they have to create to importing the external services into the mesh and also workload entry to register the um, services on the VM into the mesh. So it's a lot of learning, which is why we definitely recommend you to kind of pick a scenario and then keep iterating that and develop a best uh, consume pattern for your user to adapt. So what are the benefits? Um, certainly, you know, it's a lot of learning curve, like we mentioned, right? A lot of learning, you know, you, you learn the resources, you apply, you iterate, uh, you know, it's a critical part of your infrastructure. You have to get some benefit to do this, right? So, um, you know, I want to use, uh, reuse one of our customer who's using Istio, right, T-Mobile. They actually gave a great presentation not so long ago at IstioCon. And, uh, you know, that summarized the benefits for them. I thought they really did a good job, you know, from an observability perspective, they gain instant insight to each of their services. And, uh, you know, they gain mutual TLS because their sidecar proxy does the work for them to secure that traffic comes, you know, out of the mesh and comes, I'm sorry, comes out of the proxy to the target service. Um, so, and then they simplify their application. I think this is the most important thing. So the service owner who develop these services can focus on their business logic and they get the consistency way provided by the service mesh to handle observability and security and traffic control and resilience. 
And then, then you can leverage your envoy to be able to develop extensions. Um, you know, when the service mesh doesn't exactly fit their user case, they can leverage envoy to develop their extension for specific for their customer needs. And I think what's at the end of the day, what's most important is really reduce their costs, right? So they saved um, thousands of engineering hours and tons of reduction in their MTTR. So those are the huge wins and the consistency, right? To be able to do these type of things consistently, regardless of which languages your services are using. So what are the next steps? If you think, you know, Istio is the service mesh that's winning, you are interested, uh, you know, because only you can decide whether service mesh is for you. Uh, what are the next steps? So we do have uh, Istio workshops that uh, my company runs. So if you are interested in some hands-on experience of Istio to get started with Istio or the best practice to deploy Istio in production, you know, register for one, any one of our workshops. Um, we'll get, definitely get you started and help you adopt Istio. Uh, we also offer Istio production support. Um, so if you don't like to, uh, you know, work with uh, upstream, which is very short-term support, if you need uh, people handholding, you know, special builds with FIPS, you know, that's when the production support would come handy. And that's all I have. I hope this really triggers, you know, your thoughts around service meshes and also, you know, give you some insights on some of the road bump and challenges in adopting a service mesh like Istio. Tony, I'm ready thank for you. any questions. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for the talk. And uh, so anybody uh, in the audience, if you have any questions, please drop them in the hop in chat right now. And while we're seeing if anybody has anything, Lynn, if you wouldn't mind just stepping back, uh, and we'd love to take a peek at, at your first couple of slides since we missed uh, we missed those due to the technical issues uh, starting off, uh, and just kind of stepping through probably the first, uh, I think, 11 slides, 12 slides was what we, we missed. That, that'd be awesome. OK, great. I, I am so sorry. I wish I knew um, that you guys missed that. Oh, no, that. no. I'm, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's, it's all good. We got, we got time now. Yeah, so I mean, you guys probably heard this probably are okay, right? Thought process which we went through and the challenges of uh, uh, microservices. Um, I tried to summarize uh, for you and what is a service mesh um, and you know what problem service mesh is trying to solve. It's really about service connectivity and how does a service mesh work. We talk about control plane, we talk about data plane. Uh, we talk about the proxy being inserted into part of your data plane. And then we talk about, you know, only you can decide, do you really need a service mesh? Microservices complicated, you know, are you using cloud native today? Are you having multiple uh, programming language in your services? Are you using microservice architecture? And uh, we want to remind you, these are the things you have to keep out uh, in your organization to see if you are ready for service mesh, maybe down the road. Um, and do you have supporting infrastructure? So we talk about Git, CLCD, we talk about repository, artifact repository, you know, observability system, metrics logging. Um, and most importantly, service mesh is, you know, the proxy is a it's your critical piece of your infrastructure. So it's very important to get it right. I think this is where you alerted me, uh, select a, a service <clears throat> mesh. Yep, yep, I, I believe so. I think I think we're all caught up. Well, uh, thank you so much for stepping through those slides. Now, uh, Lynn, uh, where are you based out of? Um, I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, right on. Oh, that's awesome. I used to live in South Carolina, not, not too far away from there. Oh, that's, yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, we, we have a, a, a couple uh, of minutes here of questions. And uh, the uh, uh, one thing that, that caught my eye was the uh, that case study at the end with 
uh, seeing that a hundred thousand engineering hours were saved with with the uh, mesh service. That's that's amazing. Good. Just talk a little bit more about the efficiencies uh, with, with with this kind of architecture. Yeah, totally. I mean, you really gain the benefits when you have a lot of services and the services are using different languages, right? Because what's interesting with service mesh is it's providing these functions you would otherwise implement in your service, right? To be able to get the observability, to be able to upgrade your connection to mutual TS, to be able to rotate your certificate every day, every other day, you know, those things are huge. Um, that, and if you, the way to think about it is if you only have one programming language, you may not think those things are huge, but if you have, five or even three, you know, those things are getting bigger and bigger. And also you have to keep maintaining your language pack, right? If you're doing a language pack for Java, okay, great. But what if your developer wants Python, wants uh, Ruby on Rails, you know, as your developer base and microservices grow, you have to maintain that language pack. You have to have a certification system to be able to rotate certificate. I mean, those are really where the savings are. Right on, right on. Well, uh, thank you so much for a great talk, Lynn, on service meshes. And